From the moment they emerged from the darkness, the Sith earned their terrifying reputation by inflicting pain and imposing their rule on the galaxy. But even among the Sith, there were those who stood out above the rest. Sith Lords so powerful, their names struck fear into the hearts of their allies and foes alike. We'll be talking about one such group of Sith today. In today's video, we're going to talk about the Dread Masters, six Sith Lords of such great power that they crippled armies and drove entire fleets insane. Attention, Sergeant on deck! Our story begins, as all good stories do, with a name. Six names, to be precise. Brontes, Bestia, Calpheus, Tyrans, Raptus, and Styrak. These were the six who would one day be known as the Dread Masters. But, of course, they didn't start out that way. Once, they were solitary like most Sith, each renowned for their expertise in their own fields. Dreadmaster Brontes was a famed Sith sorceress who specialized in Sith artifacts and rituals. Her expertise was so great that the Emperor himself assigned her to oversee the construction of the Dark Temple, a tomb for powerful Sith Lords on Dromund Kaas. This tomb was so steeped in the dark side that visitors went mad and lost their very sense of self in its airy halls, all thanks to Brontes's influence. She wielded no lightsaber, as her mastery over the Force was so great that she needed nothing else to dispatch her enemies. In due time, she would come to be known as the Architect of Fear. The only other woman among the Dreadmasters was Dreadmaster Bestia. She rose to fame when, as a still unknown Sith, she single-handedly quelled a slave rebellion. This impressive show of power won her the Emperor's attention. When she became one of the Six, she was known as the Keeper of the Dread Seeds. These were alchemical devices of great dark side influence that once planted in the ground, poisoned the landscape with dark side energy and twisted the land and living beings into grotesque monstrosities. Perhaps the strongest of all her siblings, Bestia focused on biological engineering. She crafted a menagerie of twisted creatures such as Gatekeeper Nephra, which she deployed as her first line of offense. Dreadmaster Calpheus, the prophet of the masters, was a seer who had served the emperor for hundreds of years. Thanks to his foresight, the empire crushed many slave rebellions, republic ambushes, and attempted coups. Even among prophets, he was particularly gifted with his force visions, so much so that he was selected to be the emperor's personal seer. Next, there was Dreadmaster Tyrans, the Tactician of the Masters. He was known for his brilliant analytical mind, with which he created designs and plans for the Six. He was responsible for designing the Dread Fortress, the Master's Palace on Oricon. It was built for maximum defensibility and accessibility for their monstrous servants. He also drafted the tactics employed by their servants, the Dread Guard. Not much is known about Dreadmaster Raptus before his ascension. Of all the masters, he was the most gifted with words. He had the ability of weaving compulsions into his voice that were so powerful they could lead his victims to abandon all hope or betray their principles. In fact, he was so persuasive that he once convinced his Republic captors to take their own lives after they had captured him and his siblings. With his hypnotic wordsmithing, it was no surprise that he came to be known as the Weaver of Nightmares. Raptus was the unofficial leader of the Six and would often speak for the group. Last but not least, Dreadmaster Styrak was a renowned Sith alchemist. He was considered a genius among his peers, infamous for his sadistic experiments on thousands of slaves and beasts. He was the most individualistic of the Six, and the one who left Oricon to conduct the Master's off-world business. All of these Sith were incredibly powerful on their own, but their true power was unlocked when they came together and became the Six. But what events shaped these Six into the Lords of Terror they became? More than 4,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, 
the Emperor gathered six powerful Sith with a wide range of abilities for a special mission to the distant moon, Oricon. They were tasked with combining their knowledge and mastery over the dark side to study some ancient artifacts that had been discovered on the moon, the Phobos devices. These devices were a nexus of the dark side that emanated pure, maddening terror. With their entourage and servants, the six arrived on the rocky moon and attempted to study these artifacts. Little did they know what was to come. Their servants lost their minds first, wrapped in the clutches of primal fear. But the devices didn't stop with their underlings. Soon, even the six found themselves breaking under the device's toxic influence, minds filling with paranoia, distrust, and terror. But the six were not simple men and women. They were powerful Sith, and instead of shattering under the influence of the devices, they were molded by it and reborn as the Dread Masters. Through their torment, the six became connected to one another. To survive, they had to set their natural distrust aside and chain themselves together, forming something the galaxy had never seen before, a six-way force bond. A force bond, for those who don't know, is a connection between two force-sensitive individuals who are so intrinsically linked to one another that that link extends into the fabric of the force itself. Those connected always sense the other closely, as if their self has expanded to include the other. For the six, the force bond not only melded their beings together, but also linked their vast powers. It allowed them to amplify one another's strength like a massive echo chamber. Before, they were powerful, but now they were nigh unstoppable. Harnessing the fear that had shaped them, they became the Dread Masters, Lords of Terror. From their fortress on Oricon, they recruited servants, broke them with the powers of the Phobos devices, then integrated them into the Dread Guard, a cult-like legion at their command. During the Great Galactic War, the Masters used battle meditation to drive entire fleets insane with fear. Normally, battle meditation was a force ability used to inspire troops. The caster begins by meditating, then expanding their influence over as many individuals as they can manage to bolster morale and improve stamina and overall performance. What the Dreadmasters did, however, was spread that mind-shattering terror they carried within them to cripple their enemies. Their powers were so great that they could affect entire fleets in this manner. The echo chamber of their force bond allowed them to reach enemy ships from the safety of their own dreadnought, which kept them safe during battles. With the Dreadmaster's ability to drive Republic troops insane, it became clear to the Republic that they had to be stopped, and stop them they did for a time. In 3633 BBY, 20 years before the end of the Great Galactic War, Jedi Knight Jarek Kaydan infiltrated the Dreadmaster's Dreadnought with the help of a Republic Spec Ops division team. Not much is known about the mission other than that it was a success. The Dreadmasters were captured. Publicly, the Republic announced that they were dead, but in truth, they were restrained and transported to the Republic prison world, Belsavis. Along the way, it was proven that they were too dangerous to be kept in a regular cell, as Lord Raptus drove their captors to suicide with his words alone. On Belsavis, they were first placed in the maximum security prison. However, every prisoner within a quarter mile died upon their arrival, forcing the Republic to seal them in the deepest prison on the planet, the tomb. For over 30 years, the Dreadmasters remained sealed away. That all changed when at the beginning of the Galactic War, an Imperial strike force that had infiltrated the planet liberated them from their prison. The Dreadmasters were free. After their liberation, they returned to Oricon and took command of the loyal followers who had waited for their return. From there, they gathered their forces in preparation to serve the Empire once more. That is, until the Emperor disappeared. The Emperor had been the only power the Dreadmasters were willing to obey. With him gone, they saw no reason to yield to the weak, dark council. Instead, they constructed a plan 
to conquer the galaxy for themselves. With the Emperor gone, the Dreadmasters, who were over a thousand years old by this point, saw themselves above any other Sith, including the Dark Council. Now that they had no one to answer to, they began plotting to conquer the galaxy and rule in their own name. Thrice they tried, and thrice they failed to cause lasting damage to the galaxy. They recruited warmongers such as the Warlord Kefes on Denova, eldritch monsters from the far corners of the galaxy such as the Terror from beyond on Asatian, and superweapons such as the Aurora Cannon from Bosavas. Following their failures, Dreadmaster Styrak left for Darvanus, where he recruited local cartels and warlords. In the middle of negotiations, however, a Republic strike force stormed the planet and took the operation down. In the battle that followed, Dreadmaster Styrak faced the strike team alone and was slain. Here, we need to note that when someone who shares a force bond with another dies, that bond doesn't just disappear. It leaves a wound in the force that never heals, a wound that bleeds into one's mind and aches forever. In losing their brother, not only were the remaining five wounded in the Force, but that agony was amplified exponentially through their remaining Force bonds. This was a loss they refused to survive. Unable to go on without one of the pillars that kept them standing, the remaining Dreadmasters altered their plan. Now, all they wanted was to destroy the galaxy, and themselves along with it, so they could be reunited with their brother in death. Alerted to their plans for galactic domination, both the Republic and the Empire sent forces to Oricon, though both factions took heavy losses from the oppressive influence of the Moon. After navigating the lava-filled hellscape of the planet's surface, strike teams assaulted the Dread Fortress. Even with the four lightning-spewing cybernetic tentacles that she had grafted onto her back, she was no match for the strike team. Although they expected to fight the remaining five together, Lord Brontes greeted the assailants alone on the fortress's bridge before the Dread Palace. Some might believe her bloodlust made her reckless, but the likelier truth is that she was eager to die. With Brontes dead, the strike team proceeded into the Dread Palace, where each remaining Dreadmaster fought them individually. They seemed to only be testing the team's abilities, however, as they withdrew before any final blows could be dealt. The final confrontation took place in the Dread Council Chamber, in the heart of the palace. Each master stood before their thrones, and the Force Ghosts of their fallen siblings were present. Together, they faced the strike teams, and were reunited in death. The only one left was Lord Calpheus, who barely survived the battle. After he was taken in by Republic forces, he seemed confused and lost, as if he were waking up from a long and terrible nightmare. He spent the last of his days in a Republic prison, and the Dreadmaster's legacy was over. What do you think of the terrifying tale of the Lords of Dread? Which Dreadmaster do you think was the most powerful? Feel free to let us know your thoughts in the comments below.